This is a journey of exploration. Not so much of a place, but of a man. His achievement upon this earth and the manner of his taking leave of it. He was a poet of genius, and it was here that most of his poetry was made. His life knew many paths. But let us take the simpler one, the last, to the graveyard of Lahn. His poetry was a celebration of life. Death in the face of love and the throbbing beauty of the physical world, the sky, the sea, the woodlands, the whirling flight, the skirling song of seabirds. Death in the face of these things could never make a lasting wound on the old tough spine of man's creative dreaming. Though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. Though lovers be lost, love shall not. That is what poetry is about, to cut through the blockages of distress and regret that obstruct so much of living, and to make eternal in a preserve of words all the ecstasy, the laughter, the love, the kindness, that can give a blessing, a glory to our days. It is no easy thing to be a poet. The Greeks regarded poetry as a function of the blind. Today, it is more generally regarded as a function of the mad. The poet records the private heartbeat of his time, and his time does not particularly want to know about it. It is easier by far to be a merchant, a stockbroker, a pop singer, or a tramp. It hurts less and pays better money. The poet writes for the few, the very few who listen through the night and feel the vast pulse of joy, anguish, yearning or terror that beats around them. Life is full of empty places where love might have been, had the eyes of the heart been brighter, and the poet haunts these places crying for fulfillment, for a new lease of tenderness between men. Not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on these spendthrift pages, nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. He lived in a boathouse on the edge of the great estuary. It comes as near to being afloat as a house can. It suited Dullan perfectly. He hated loneliness, yet could not live without it or the illusion of it. An estuary is the perfect place for a poet. It hasn't got the absolute tyrannical mastery of the open sea, yet it suggests escape from the conventions of landbound men. The flux of tide and the pathos of sea rack are the age-long symbols of man's life and fate. The sky suspended over the meeting of land and sea celebrates the fact with swift, unpredictable changes of pattern. The rhythm of life around one is steady and assuring. Only one tension remains, that of awaiting the next nudge towards creative effort. And with this massive calm around one, it will come. The sea is everywhere in the poetry of Dullan Thomas. Its majesty, its menace, its implacable siege and surge. There is nothing left of the sea but its sound. Under the earth, the loud sea walks in deathbeds of orchards. The boat goes down and the bait is drowned among hayricks. Goodbye, good luck, struck the sea and the moon to the fisherman lost on the land. He stands alone at the door of his home with his long-legged heart in his hand. Larne Castle. One of the innumerable trusses of stone with which the Normans and their successors tried to keep our twitching limbs reasonably still. For a poet, an ancient ruin is a fascination. Through its worked stone, all time seems to stir. The imagination can rise like a seabird. All the pity, pride and pain that nourish the songs of men are in any abandoned pile of stone raised by human hands. The Normans are dead. Dullan Thomas is dead. The sound of the sea remains. That's what the castle says. And the reeds, like a poet, these, poised precariously between sea and land, fragile but with a curious creative strength that makes them thrive and whisper. Now the heron grieves in the weeded verge. Through windows of dusk and water, I see the tilting, whispering heron mirrored go as the snapped feathers snow fishing in the tear of the Towie. Now on Sir John's Hill, Milkwood. 
The poet would not go without this. The mysteries and miracles of non-human life that trees shelter and nourish. The calm that abates the wasteful fret of human concern. This path, these ferns and twisted trees, were a conscious nerve of Dallin Thomas's verse. The poet's eye can look down upon this world. The terror of an insect, the drift of light through trees, the cry of owl or fox can trigger off shots of apprehension and delight. Each of us carries a store of gold in the back room of the mind, and most of the gold comes from the remembered sunlit mornings of childhood, in the years before we learned to put a callous crust between ourselves and pure, simple delight. On this path, Dylan Thomas could find at any time the vision of innocence and rapture that spreads over all his poetry like a rainbow. And I saw in the turning so clearly a child's forgotten mornings when he walked with his mother through the parables of sunlight and the legends of the green chapels. And the twice told fields of infancy that his tears burned my cheeks and his heart moved in mine. These were the woods, the river, the sea, where a boy in the listening summertime of the dead whispered the truth of his joy. He came here as a boy to spend his summer holidays with his mother's people. And despite the savage restlessness that occasionally drove him loping through the world like a sick, lost wolf, it was to this place that he would always have returned. For here, upon those slopes fronting the sea, lay in recollection and in fact the things that had created the mind of the boy Dullan in the days when he was still untouched, unhurt. Now nothing remains, only the words, the recorded loveliness, the honey that dripped from his lighted mind.